Hey, thanks for joining me again on BioInfano and we're going to be talking about lab write-ups. If that sounds good, stick around. I've got some great tips for you. Okay, first of all, I hope everyone's doing okay and keeping safe during this coronavirus pandemic. Remember to follow the advice of your healthcare professionals, which includes staying at home if you don't have to go out, right? You've got to practice your social distancing. Don't forget to wear your mask and sanitize your hands as often as you can. We're all in this together. Now, before we get started, let me offer you this disclaimer. The methods and tips that I'm highlighting in this video are based on criteria outlined in the Caribbean Ordinary Level Examinations for Biology, although some of the criteria can be used in the advanced level write-ups as well. All right. Also, and probably even more importantly, different teachers have different preferences. So it's a really good idea to consult with your teacher first about what they might want or expect from you in writing up your labs. So with that said, let's get to it. So what is a lab report? Well, to put it simply, it's the way you present your findings after you've completed your experiments. See, labs are methods that we use to answer questions that are based on observations that we have. Today, our sample lab is going to be an osmosis lab. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to link all of my resources for you in the description below so you can always follow and practice with me as we go along. You can also pause the video here so you can read the experiment's instructions but it'll also be linked below anyway. Now there are a few different criteria tested when we're doing labs. So for example there's measurement and manipulation which tests your ability to use apparatus and carry out processes in a lab safely. We have observation, recording and reporting, which looks at your ability to represent your findings in a clear and concise way. Uh, we have analysis and interpretation, which highlights your use of data and ability to extrapolate and come to logical conclusions. We have drawing labs, which tracks your observational skills. And we have plan and design labs, which tests your ability to use scientific methods for testing observations. Now, for today's video, we're gonna be testing three of those criteria we're going to be looking at measurements and manipulations observation recording reporting and analysis and interpretation so let's get started with the mm aspect of the lab so looking at the mm criteria you can see that it's about perfecting the skills necessary in a lab how do you handle the apparatus how do you handle the material are you taking accurate measurements now i won't stay too long on these criteria because training on the use of these lab materials and apparatus will be done in the lab by your teachers. Plus, there are tons of videos right here on YouTube teaching you just that. So next, we're gonna look at the ORR criteria. I've created an incomplete lab write-up for the Osmosis Lab, and we're gonna work on it together to ensure that we meet all the criteria that's listed here. The criteria that we're gonna be looking at are the formatting of the lab, the method and how we write it up, the results that we're gonna state, and any graphs that are needed for this lab. So now to make it easy, I've got a sample lab on the right that we're going to be cross-referencing with our mark scheme on the left. So let's do that now. So we've got here the formatting. Firstly, they said that all headings should be present. However, this is a work in progress, so this is a particular continuous goal. Every time you add a new heading, you're basically adding to this one. Second, we need to ensure that all of these headings are clearly defined, which means that they should all be in caps, bolded, and underlined. That's not true on this side because you can look at the sections here, name, date, title, aim, apparatus and material, and you can see that they're not capped, they're not bold, and they're not underlined. So let's fix that now. Now all our section headings are clearly defined. So it takes us now to our next objective. The aim is present and clearly stated. Well, like I said, this was a sample lab that I prepared from before. So we have our aim here, and you can see that it's to investigate the effects of different conditions of potato cylinders on potato cylinders. So our aim is present, and now we look to apparatus and material. Here's your list of apparatus and material. However, it's not in point form. So we want to find a more suitable format, like for example, utilizing bulleted lists or numbered lists. I can take it one step further and utilize a table that lists the apparatus and the material in point form as well. This saves on space. However, it 
can be a point of contention with some teachers so it's a good idea to get your teacher's advice first before doing up your apparatus and material as a tabled list. So now we go to the method. So we've started a new section so as previously stated once you're starting a new section you should put it in the section heading. Now the method is in past tense already. I know this because in order to save time I wrote it myself. Uh, however it's not numbered or bulleted. We'll get back to the logical sequence of steps in a second. So first let's get this changed into a numbered or bulleted list. So now it's a numbered list. Uh, so it takes us back now what is a logical sequence of steps? So a logical sequence of steps simply means that each step should follow into each other so that whatever occurs at number one is continuous to number two which is continuous to number three. For example, I can't utilize a cylinder to place it into a test tube if I haven't first created the cylinder itself. So I can't expect that this step where a cork borrow is used to obtain three cylinders would be following this step where the third cylinder was placed in another test tube. So you just need to ensure that it's in the correct order. So, have I obtained all my marks on the method? Is it in past tense? Yes. Is there a logical sequence of steps? Yes. Is each step numbered or bulleted? Yes. Okay, so we go now to results. So to look at our results now, we see that a table needs to be used and a table needs to be neatly boarded. Do we have a neatly boarded table? Yes, we do. So the next is that the table should be titled at the top with all capital letters and all underlined. So we've got our title on the top, but it's not all, all capital letters, nor is it on the line. So let's fix that now. Okay, great. Now it's important to note that your table title should be descriptive rather than a versus title. Um, very often people write something like tables showing test tube versus potato cylinders, but that's not descriptive. So instead we write something like tables showing the observations on potato cylinders. Right? This is a descriptive title and it's a type of titles that we utilize most often. Now, didn't mention it before, but this is a results section. So again, keeping with what we did before. Right? So we go back and look, are the units in the heading row and not in the body of the table? So we have initial length in CM, final length in CM. So we see that the units are in the top of the table, but they're not contained in the body. You don't want to have something like this in your table. Lastly, the manipulated variable is on the left column while the responding variable is on the right column. So a manipulated variable is something that you have changed. So that's the different types of test tubes. So they are on the left. And then comparatively, you've got your responding variable, which is what changes because of what you did. That's the final length. And that is on the right as well. So to look at the graph next, I have a completed graph on the right for us to compare out to our criteria. For example, there's a title, right, with capital letters and descriptive. There's a scale. Uh, the graph occupies a majority of the page. And you'll notice that a key is also present. Now, take a look at the axes. You'll see that the x-axis contains your manipulated variable and your y-axis contains your responding variable. But there's only units in the y-axis because we don't actually have any units for the x-axis in this case. However, once you've got units for it, you should always state it there as well too. Now, there are some unwritten rules about graphs that I want you to actually know about, right? So the most important one is how do you choose the correct graph that you're going to use? Um, do you use a line graph? Do you use a bar graph? So the difference is really, it's going to come down to types of data. Are you looking at discontinuous data or continuous data? In this experiment, we're looking at discontinuous data because you have potato cylinder A, which is in open air, potato cylinder B, which is in pure water, and you have potato cylinder C, which is in salty water. Each one falls into its own separate class or distinctive region. So therefore, we're going to use discontinuous data and discontinuous data, we can use a bar graph. Now, if we're looking instead at continuous data, for example, if I were to compare the pH and I would compare pH 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, etc., then I can use a line because that is an example of continuous data where one characteristic basically merges into the next. So by that comparison, choosing a graph really comes down to is it continuous data or is it discontinuous data? For discontinuous data, you could generally stick with bar graphs 
for continuous data, you can use histograms or line graphs. Which brings me to the last two points that are present here on these criteria for graphs. Uh, notice that the points should be plotted using X's or a dot in a circle, or and also that the line should be neatly plotted. Now in this particular case, because we're using a bar graph, those two criteria don't come into play. However, if you are doing a line graph, a neatly plotted line means that in biology, uh, we usually tend to join all of the points that are present. This is not like physics, for example, where you may be using a line of best fit. So next we look at our AI mark scheme. Now your AI is mainly based on your discussion, your precautions, your sources of error, limitations, improvements, and your conclusion. It's basically all of the analysis that you're going to do for this particular experiment. So how do you interpret your results? Things like that. Now, again, in keeping with what we've been doing so far, I have a completed discussion on this idea, which I'm not going to go through point by point, but instead give you a general idea of what's being looked for. Now, considering that this experiment is about osmosis, one of the first things you're going to expect to have to, to do is to actually define osmosis. So that should make up your first or opening statement in your discussion. Now, <clears throat> another important thing is that remember we talked about in your ORR that you should have formatting being consistent. So in your discussion, for every new point that you make, you should try your best to always start a new paragraph with it. It gives the idea of separation and it makes it easier to follow as you go along the lap. So what I'm going to do here is basically I'm going to show you with this discussion, we're going to have to define osmosis. We're going to tell them what occurred in A and why it occurred, what occurred in B, why it also occurred, what occurred in C and why it occurred. Those are the easiest parts of it. Now, you may sometimes get discussion questions in your lab, which is fine because you can follow the format that's given to you. But in the event that you aren't given it, this is what is expected of you in a discussion. You are basically going to describe what you saw and explain why you saw it to the best of your ability. Another point of contention for most people is that they don't understand what precautions, sources of errors and limitations are in their labs. So let's go through that now. A precaution is anything that you would do, any step that you would take that would reduce errors during the experiment. So for example, the volume of solution used was the same for test tubes B and C. So rather than one of them completely covering the, um, the potato cylinder and another one only partially covering it, you use the same volume of water overall so that we know that that's no longer going to be a problem in the experiment. Uh, the tubes were all left in the same area of the lab. So things like temperature, wind, uh, it will all be the same because it's all going to affect the same test tubes in the same place. Right? Those are examples of what precautions are. It's something that you do to reduce the chance of an error. Then comparatively, you've got sources of error. Now sources of error are anything that would have happened during the experiment that may have led to an inaccuracy that you probably didn't have much control over. Perhaps you um, used a potato that was a little bit older and you didn't really know. Right? That would have been an example of a source of error. Uh, for, I have one written here that the salt solution was of an unknown concentration, which means that you may not have known um, if it was concentrated enough to cause the changes that we wanted to see. Uh, next we have limitations. So your limitations are something that you can do that makes your experiment more accurate, but it's not really available to you. So during this experiment, you thought of some ways that, hey, if I did this, my experimental results can get better. So I can do that and get better results, that's an improvement. So the experiment can be repeated using more potato cylinders and various concentrations of salt solutions. If I did that, I'd probably get to see more changes in the potato cylinders and therefore back up my results even more. Now lastly, you have a conclusion. So a conclusion is a statement that confirms or denies your aim and it should be related to that aim. So, your conclusion isn't a long paragraph, it isn't long-winded, it usually takes up about two to four lines and that's about it. And you just verify or deny your aim based on what you saw in your results and what you worked out in your discussion. So that's our video for today. I'm trying not to get it to be too long and boring, so I'm going to stop there and what I'll do is I'll do a part two video where I'm going to cover 
drawing labs and I'm going to cover plan and design labs. So if you like the content, if you thought it was helpful, if you thought it was informative, please feel free to like and subscribe below. It really helps and I appreciate all the support that you guys have given me so far. I will see you all in the next video. Thanks for joining me on Biofano. Bye guys. Later.